Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 2022 Kevin Hawkins Lecture feature, featuring speaker Mark Moriel, president and CEO of the National Urban League. Uh, we're gonna take one minute uh, before we get started to make sure all the attendees are rolling in. Good morning again and welcome everyone. Welcome to the 2022 Kevin Hawkins lecture featuring keynote speaker Mark Moriel, president and CEO of the National Urban League. I'm Donna Howard, vice president for institutional advancement and I'm the host for today's lecture. Uh, before we begin the program, just wanted to go over a few housekeeping items. Uh, because of the size of the call, you'll notice that everyone is on mute. If you have questions during the call, please pop them into the chat at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can during the Q&A session. Our Q&A session today will be moderated by our Pulitzer Prize winning columnist and faculty member, Professor E.R. Shipp. Uh, any questions that get missed will be followed up by email. We'll also be emailing a recording of this session, and it'll be posted on our social media. With that, I will turn it over to our Dean of the School of the Earl G. Gray's School of Business, Dean Bogosian, to kick us off. Good morning, everyone. The Kevin Hawkins Endowed Lectureship was established in 2013 by our alum, Kevin Hawkins. The purpose is to enrich the university's learning environment by bringing respected thought leaders to the campus to present the latest thinking and research on evolving issues of significant importance in business, management, marketing, administration, and economics. Our thanks and gratitude to Kevin Hawkins for making this lectureship possible. Some members of the Dean's Advisory Board are on this call today. Mr. Hawkins himself is also a member of the Dean's Advisory Board. Thank you. And we'll now hear from Dr. Wilson, who will introduce our keynote speaker and welcome us this morning. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Howard. And good morning to all of you who are joining us. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Kevin Hawkins for making this particular lecture possible. Uh, we are indeed honored, uh, privileged actually, uh, to have with us um, uh, a national thought leader in this space, uh, President Mark Moriel. Um, President Mark Morial really needs no introduction uh, to the Morgan audience or any other audience, but um, he has been described as one of the few national leaders in this country uh, who um, possesses uh, really both what uh, people call street smarts um, and uh, boardroom savviness <laughs> uh, and uh, is indeed, as Ms. Howard indicated, the current president uh, and CEO of the National Urban, Urban League, uh, which uh, is the nation's largest historic civil rights and urban advocacy organization in this country. Um, uh, President Morial has served as the highly successful and popular mayor of New Orleans, uh, as well as as president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Uh, he previously uh, was a, a state senator in uh, Louisiana uh, and, of course, was a lawyer in New Orleans with a very active, uh, high-profile practice. Um, without a doubt, you know, he is a leading voice on the national stage uh, in the battle for jobs and education and housing uh, and voting rights equity. I have really appreciated, uh, President Morial, your voice uh, in pushing the nation to do the right thing and make sure uh, that voting rights um, are uh, where they should be in this country. Um, and so um, he is a, a graduate of uh, a Georgetown University Law Center uh, and also an undergraduate from the University of Pennsylvania and has been recognized as one of the 100 most influential uh, Black Americans by Ebony Magazine, 
uh, as one of the top 50 nonprofit leaders uh, by Nonprofit Times, um, and one of the most uh, or the top 100 most influential black lawyers in America, and has also been inducted into the International Civil Rights uh, Walk of Fame in Atlanta. I could go on and on and on, but you're not here to hear me. You're here to <laughs> hear President Moriel. And so uh, please join me in giving a virtual round of applause, if you will, uh, to our speaker uh, for today, President Mark Moriel. Thank you. Uh, let me first of all say thank you to Dr. Wilson uh, and the Morgan State University community. And Dr. Wilson, I want to thank you for your leadership uh, and your work and that of your entire leadership team. Uh, in really, really advancing uh, the very important role that Morgan State University plays in preparing the next generation of entrepreneurs, uh, citizen people uh, to be impact players in 21st century America. Uh, I wanna thank uh, each and every uh, one of those who helped to pull today's event together. Certainly acknowledge Kevin Hawkins uh, and his important contribution and leadership uh, to the Morgan State uh, community. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge your distinguished graduate for whom the School of Business is named, the late, great Earl Graves. Uh, and I wanna lift up Earl Graves in a profound way today because his role as an advocate for economic justice through entrepreneurship and black business growth and development uh, is singular. Uh, in American history. What he was able to do with Black Enterprise, it was a Bible. Uh, it was a resource guide. It was where you learn so much about Black business. I read Black Enterprise as a teenager, as a young person, as it was uh, one of those magazines uh, that my family uh, subscribed to. So I want to lift up the spirit, uh, the energy, the contributions of Earl Graves and his family uh, and his sons, and his son who now uh, runs the Black Enterprise, uh, if you will, ecosystem today, the magazine, the online, uh, the events and the work that they indeed do. Here's where I wanna start. For a generation of Black entrepreneurs, it was entrepreneurship by necessity, by absolute necessity. After the Civil War and Black people began to gain some measure of freedom in the South and also began in the great migration uh, to traverse to Northern communities. Discrimination was still rampant. Jim Crow, lynching, all of the horrors of the post-Civil Rights, rather the post-Civil War world, uh, were a reality for Black Americans. But the ingenuity and the skill of Black Americans who had during slavery been the contractors and the event planners and the cooks and served in important capacities during slavery to, 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 to support uh, white slave owners in those times, those great skills were then being now deployed to create businesses out of the necessity of the moment. The necessity of the moment meant uh, we, uh, in the days of segregation, were not served by white haberdashers or florists or funeral services folks or doctors or lawyers or shoe repair people. So black people out of necessity created businesses, created businesses to serve primarily the black community. And such was the case certainly, yes, in places like Baltimore and Philadelphia and New York, but significantly in places like Richmond and Charlotte and Savannah and Atlanta and Birmingham and Memphis and New Orleans. And in places like Miami, we created businesses and black folks were successful as entrepreneurs, independent with no access to banks, with no access to private equity. We built 
businesses that were significant and in many respects sustainable, sustainable. When Earl Graves in 1971 or two became uh, the publisher of Black Enterprise Magazine and for the first time put together the list of the largest black owned businesses in America. At the top of that list was Motown Records and Barry Gordy clocking in at 40 million in revenues a year. On that list was Fedco, then owned by J. Bruce Llewellyn, a, uh, a, uh, a, uh, a grocer uh, and retailer. Uh, on that list were a number of others uh, who uh, own businesses of considerable concern, even against the backdrop of barriers and lack of access to capital and limited customer base and serving only black people in those communities, people built businesses. The New Orleans of my youth was a business where my family members only bought gas at the black owned Esso station. That was the predecessor to Exxon. It was a place where they went to the black owned meat market, Volker songs. It was a place where there were multiple black owned newspapers, black florists, black contractors, black bricklayers, black doctors and dentists and lawyers, black real estate brokers and agents. The tradition of entrepreneurship in black America is strong and it was entrepreneurship against all odds, against all odds. Today, as we come forward, we must reestablish building entrepreneurship and businesses as a central element in the work of civil rights and justice. Why? Because to close the wealth gap, we must be owners of real estate, of property, of homes, of land, of businesses. We must be owners, not just consumers. And entrepreneurship is a pathway to do it. You have heard, because it's been widely reported, about the impact that COVID had on Black-owned enterprises. Some 41% of them closing permanently or temporarily. I learned yesterday from Ron Busby, who leads the US Black Chambers of Commerce, that there are a number of these businesses that have reopened, that are seeking to get back on their feet, that have responded to and demonstrated a great deal of resiliency so once again, while some 20% of mainstream or white owned businesses closed permanently or temporarily due to the pandemic, double the number closed or were impacted uh, who were black owned in our nation. So against that backdrop, we're at a new inflection point of rebuilding. What is important and what do I see in the rebuilding from a perspective of policy, well, it, it is true that the Paycheck Protection Program in, in its first iteration was not equitable nor responsive to Black-owned businesses. It is true that in its second iteration, some changes were made, not that perfected it, but made it better and allowed some Black-owned businesses black led nonprofits in church. Uh, but now I believe there should be and must be and is in some places a renewed, refreshed, stronger commitment. What does it entail? Uh, a number of uh, uh, people and we are participants in this have understood that to confront the problem of capital that we must go beyond just providing loans it needs to be access to equity capital, equity grants, I call that. So we now 
at the National Urban League are the leaders of the Black Restaurant Accelerator Program, where we will, over the next five years, put $1 million in grant money, not loan money, into Black-owned businesses in approximately 10 U.S. cities. And we encourage others to follow suit to inject capital into these businesses through grants, through equity, through methodologies and means other than loans. We do need loans. We do need access to loan funds. We do not need access to debt capital as well to be improved and increased. But we gotta go beyond the paradigm that access to capital is just about more debt. That it is about investments in black businesses. It is about investments through grants, investment through private equity, investments in far or far wider methods and means than simply loans. So I've seen some beginnings of that and I wanna encourage all of you to be advocates for that. Number two, there is and there are a larger number of entrepreneurship classes and programs at historically black universities than one might imagine. And I encourage the business faculties of, and the leaders of our historically black colleges and universities to understand that entrepreneurship is a component of business administration. But that entrepreneurship is also about learning a different set of skills and understanding how to start a business, how to mine an idea, how to develop an idea, how to develop and use the tools of technology to build a business. Business people now, small business and entrepreneurs, I do a lot of, I like doing business with small entrepreneurs who happen to be street vendors. Well, you used to be in the old days, you went to the street vendor, you had to have cash. Now the street vendor takes credit cards because he's got a technology like Square, for example, uh, that uh, he or she can utilize, which makes it much easier uh, for a, bar, a wider array of customers. And of course, cash if you want, but if you don't have cash, you don't spend cash. Or if all of a sudden you see something that is greater in price than the cash you have in your pocket. Uh, small business owners are using tools like Facebook and Twitter and Instagram to market their businesses in a low cost way. We have to teach young entrepreneurs how to do this effectively. Many are learning how to do it on their own through their own ingenuity and creativity, and that is good. But there's also a science behind the maximization of technology. We have to invest in standing up, training, teaching a new generation of business people and entrepreneurs who may decide they don't wanna work for someone else, they wanna work for themselves. Or like so many do, I do have a day job, but then I've got a business on the side, I've got an entrepreneurial idea on the side that I'm gonna build on my own time so that at the point I can be independent, I can cut the cord from my employer and go do my own. That's a time-honored tradition uh, in the nation, but also a, a special time-honored tradition in Black America. So we have to prepare, train, invest. Thirdly, we need banks, the government, government agencies, city governments, airport authorities, water authorities, housing authorities, demand that everyone have a plan and a policy to nurture, encourage, and ensure that Black and other businesses owned by communities and people of color have a chance to grow and participate. Building sustainable businesses and sustainable independent businesses is a way to develop our communities. We are consumers Black America is to the two to one and a half trillion dollars a year in this country. Our black owned businesses, 90% of them have one employee. There is so much opportunity out here, but we have to prepare and train and we have to demand. At this moment, the Biden administration shepherded through Congress a brand new infrastructure bill. I'm excited about it. It's significant investment. However, 
we have to make sure, demand and hold everyone accountable. From the president all the way on down, every mayor, council member, school board member, bank, chamber of commerce, to make sure planning authority that this infrastructure plan does not damage nor does it bypass black America when it comes to jobs and contractual opportunities. What does every city, state, and community, a plan? Your mayor should have a plan. Your city council with your mayor should have a plan. Independent government agencies like school boards, ports, transit authorities should have a plan. That plan should be well known to people. We have to lift up uh, the fact that there has to be a commitment that's real and a plan to ensure full and complete participation. We can't do it the way it was done in the past. It must be done differently. The National Urban League's voice, our advocacy will be in front of doing this. I was on a call just 15 minutes ago. We're putting an event together with the National Minority Supplier Development Council. If you are interested, follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, so you can also be a part of some of what we're doing to advise the community, inform the community about the opportunities, but also to place the demands and the accountability on elected officials and big business owners and contractors and broadband companies who are gonna be direct beneficiaries of these dollars and of these programs. So we have to do that as well. We have to do that as well. And third, we have to remember that it all gets down to capital customers and contracts. And we have to work and demand that banks, financial services firms do much more uh, to, uh, to address uh, the challenges and the issues of access to capital uh, and recognize that they've got to uh, make adjustments to some things. I was at the Department of Housing and Urban Development yesterday with Secretary Marsha Fudge, great American former congresswoman from Cleveland, uh, who is now leading that agency, who shared with us some changes she's making at the FHA in terms of how student loans are counted in the underwriting decision, meaning the background checking that's done before when one is, is determines whether one's eligible to home to get a home loan uh, so that that student loan does not count as much against the borrower. We need that kind of thinking when it comes to business lending to increase capital access. Uh, and so we are going to be working on those fronts as well. Uh, I want to encourage all the entrepreneurs and all the young people and all the students who wish to become entrepreneurs or those of you who are already entrepreneurs. Maybe entrepreneurship isn't for everyone, but it is for many. Maybe it's about us also understanding that we've got to support as customers, entrepreneurs and businesses in our community when we can. Uh, we have to fundamentally understand that this is also part of our approach to dismantling structural and institutional racism for us to build businesses in our community that can employ people, that can have impact, and that can help build wealth. So I know there's a discussion ensuing, questions that are coming. Final thing I wanna say is that the National Urban League, we have a comprehensive strategy around this. The centerpiece of it is that we have right now 12 entrepreneur, 14 entrepreneurship center programs that serve 14,000 small businesses, primarily black owned businesses, by providing classes, coaching, counseling, help them with marketing plans, help them to get loan ready, help them develop business plans, help them to understand how to go after customers and make proposals. We support businesses in a hands-on way that work we do. We also have, uh, when we will be relaunching our loan fund, our community development financial institution called Urban Empowerment Fund sometime later this year. And then we have a conference that we do in the next conference, Small Business Matters, will take place at our annual conference in Washington, D.C. in July. 
follow us on social media if you want to be a part of that conference. And then we are an advocate on Capitol Hill with the White House, with the agencies pushing for African-American business participation in everything, in every initiative that the government undertakes. And we're particularly excited that the Biden administration has been more responsive than any prior administration in quite many, many years uh, to this message about entrepreneurship. So I'm going to pause there. I'm going to stop there. I'm going to thank Morgan State University. I look forward to visiting Morgan State University uh, sometime in person, sometime in the future, Dr. Wilson and team. I look forward to doing it. I appreciate the work you're doing. And I am so, so honored to be able to be with all of you today. So thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, this is Professor Ship. for those who are tuning in. Uh, I will now start us off with some questions. Uh, I, first, will you tell us a little bit about your own entrepreneurial background uh, that could be perhaps beneficial and uh, inspiring to our students? Yeah, you know, I uh, started my first little business at 15 years old at a, as a summer project with three friends, two friends. And we had an idea that we were going to start a business. We called it Mercury Janitorial Service. We actually got some floors made. And we were going to wash cars, wax floors, cut grass, and do other odd jobs in New Orleans. So we got the flyers made. Uh, we put the flyers on the flyer, and all of a sudden, the phone started ringing. Uh, and we, that summer, went to people's homes. I remember the first time we showed up at Mrs. Adams' house. This is at Mrs. Adams had a big house in the neighborhood. She was a, a, a widow at the time. She was an older woman. And she called up on the phone. And then when we showed up as three 15-year-olds, she said, you're Mercury Janitorial Service? <laughs> I said, yes, ma'am, we are. She said, well, what, what, what is it that you all know how to do? So we begged her to give her a chance. She wouldn't let her come, she would not let us come in her house and wax floors. She did let us wash her cars and clean her windows. And so that was my first little venture. Then I had a second venture when I was in college uh, uh, with another friend. We created a, uh, an event, a party promotions business. Uh, where we promoted parties at nightclubs in, 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 in New Orleans, where we cut deals with, uh, uh, with nightclub owners to, to do parties on their slow nights, which were typically Tuesday and Wednesday. And we would take the door, we charge three, four, five dollars, and they take the bar. And so we'd make money off the door and they'd make money off the bar. And we, we'd hype it and come up with a theme and make it something. And, that was my second venture. And my third venture was a venture I had in law school when I started a t-shirt and cap business. Uh, and I was able to win a contract from the New Orleans World's Fair, won a little contract and purchase order from the New Orleans, US, New Orleans USFL, the New Orleans Breakers football team. So those are my early little ventures. Uh, you know, made a few dollars, learned a few things, made a lot of mistakes. I didn't know what I didn't know. We didn't know what we didn't know. Uh, but we were out there, and, and the second enterprise, we actually went to uh, went to a lawyer, a young lawyer, and 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 paid him one hundred and fifty dollars to incorporate. So we had a, actually had a corporation, and the second then we had a bank account. Uh, I don't think a lot of money ended up in the bank account, but we had a bank account. But it was more just you know uh, these little ventures were my little journey. To becoming an entrepreneur. Ultimately, uh, I ended up uh, uh, running my own law practice. I started a law business when I was 27 years old, and, uh, and, and it formed the basis of my law practice. I ended up having five, six employees, rented about 2,000, 3,000 square feet of downtown office space. It was truly, truly a journey and a learning journey. And as I look back on what I didn't know, <laughs> It's why I think it's so important that in schools and in, 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 in communities, we teach people uh, about entrepreneurship, about taxes and business licenses and some of the basic things that you, you don't know when you're an entrepreneur, you just, just have a vision and an idea. And I encourage young people to pursue their vision. 
uh, you know, I didn't, uh, you know, this was just me and my friends thinking about ways we could not only make money, but, uh, you know, enjoy something we, we like doing. And so, you know, with the party planning business, you know, we, we, we I remember we probably, you know, we made, we made money. I mean, we had a little formula with these nightclubs and, uh, and it worked and we did it primarily during the summers when we were in college and uh, uh, it was, it was, it was exciting. So that was my journey. You know, my journey in entrepreneurship started when I was 15 years old. Uh, so at what, just, point, at what point did you go from thinking of yourself as just having a side hustle uh, to being an entrepreneur? What was that change of mindset? I think that when I started the cap and t-shirt business, I think I, I saw big opportunity. But I just, I started that business before I finished law school. And then I think when I finished law school, I became very, very focused on becoming a lawyer uh, and building business as a lawyer. But the fact that I had been an entrepreneur meant I kind of knew how to set up a business, how to run a business, how to kind of get the basics organized, right, uh, around the business. So everything is, you know, it, it's cumulative in terms of how you learn. You learn by what you do. Uh, and, uh, and, and I say that the work I did as an entrepreneur, probably more than anything, taught me things that I have used when I became the mayor, when I run the national, because I understand things, I, mean, I knew some basic things, right? How to set up a business, how to organize a little, how to hire employees, and some of the basic stuff, how to make sure you file your reports and your taxes and your registrations on time. Now, uh, I'm going to uh, let Mr. Omar Muhammad ask a question now, and then I'll return, hopefully, and ask more. Thank you. Appreciate it. member of the Entrepreneurship Program in the Business School, uh, Mr. Muhammad. All right. Great. Thank you. Those kind of words. So I have a ton of questions, but I only get to answer one, <laughs> ask one. And, you know, what you were describing was uh, what this uh, these tech organizations in Silicon Valley did. You know, they had the capital, they impacted um, legislation, training. Um, they had networks and media as well. So if you would put your mayor cap on along with the president of the National Urban League and just come to Baltimore, um, especially over there where on North Avenue, where the, the quote unquote riots took place. Uh, for me, I think entrepreneurship is the key to reducing some of the crime here in Baltimore. Uh, so just imagine working with the community and having a community uh, learn entrepreneurship and start owning the shops where they are. Um, so it, it, you mentioned government contracting and participating in government contracting, but also becoming a tech center as well. So your thoughts on you know, getting that started uh, as it relates to really start here in Baltimore and becoming a model around the world. So I think that's a great, great question. I think like one thing city governments, state governments, universities can do is make physical space available, shared space, incubation space, uh, retail space uh, that can be shared by, by retailers. I mean, to make physical space that's nice, uh, that's available for sharing so people could say, I can set up. I can operate at a low expense because we're gonna share the space, we're gonna share. I think that's one thing city governments can do. I think uh, commercial property owners can do it. Uh, I think universities and colleges can do it. Make space available for entrepreneurs. People who wanna be entrepreneurs, they need some space to operate. They also wanna be in a collaborative environment. The second thing is, I think we can also help people focus on, there are things that I call necessities. Mm -hmm. And when you sell, provide necessities, you have businesses that will always have customers. Warren Buffett, who's legendary, mm -hmm. says one of the secrets to his investing strategy was investing in necessities. Things people have to have versus niceties. So people need food, they need clothing, they need shelter, they need tax services. There's certain things that people need when people focus on, let me think about provide, providing necessities, sometimes this is a route to profitability or indeed to success. 
Uh, I also believe that as you are doing at the center there, which I really completely compliment, I think let encouraging people to understand you have to learn this craft and this art uh, of, of, of how to be a successful entrepreneur. How do you get organized? How do you get set up? Uh, what kind of technology do you need? And, and, and where's the best place to get it so you're not falling for a ripoff artist? Uh, if you do have a relationship with a bank, what does that really mean? What do they do for you? What should they do for you? How do you protect uh, your money? Uh, if you hire people, how do you say, I'm not going to just hire my, my peeps, my boys, my friends, my girls, you know, uh, unless they understand that they're going to be working for me. And this is not, this is a serious thing here. You know, I have to serve uh, my customers. So I think there's a lot in a neighborhood that can be done. I think creating physical space is a role that government can play, universities can play, commercial property owners can play. Uh, and, and, and I also think that uh, we, we also have to challenge the businesses that do business in our community. You know, whether they're grocers, drug stores, retailers, shoe stores, to do business in our community, to create opportunities in our communities, to invest back in our communities. Uh, we have to, you know, demand that and, and, and require it. But, but I think, you know, the, the key is, is for people to think about, look, you, you, we buy a lot of shoes. Uh, you know, we buy a lot of shoes. I've seen a lot of people develop businesses where they, they do customized shoes and customized clothing. I mean, look, part of it is also being creative. Uh, I've got a friend in New Orleans. She created a, a retail store. And then she said, you know, I got a lot of space in my store. I'm going to create a pop-up opportunity like once a month or on holidays for other people who sell jewelry and creative items, clothing, who don't have a space, working out of their house or working online to come in and set up. I'll just get a hundred bucks from them. And then I'll let them set up and then I'll, you know, we'll market jo jointly. And, and then they end up having more people than they can literally serve because I do think there's also a mindset in our community to want to support businesses in our community. But we also have to give our people quality products, good customer service, right? You have to understand when you put yourself out there to serve customers, we, they, they expect us to be professional, they expect us to be competitive from a pricing standpoint, and they want the right customer service in our dealings with them. So there's so much uh, that we can do. I think city governments, I think housing authorities, I think state governments, uh, I think you big universities and other colleges can play a significant role uh, in, in helping to stand this up you know, in our neighborhoods and in our communities. When I was mayor, we had, uh, every time we had a big project come to town, we had multiple information sessions. We told the project promoters, developers, you have to do uh, business with people in the community and we're gonna create an information session and we're gonna come talk to them about how to do business uh, with you. We're gonna talk to them about how to get jobs uh, with you. Uh, we're, we're gonna facilitate and match make uh, the opportunities. And I think there's a lot that we can do by doing things like that. You know, your center is probably doing that kind of work. I think we got to get the city governments involved. I think we've got to demand that the state governments and government agencies be involved, the airport authorities, transit authorities, uh, uh, housing authorities, uh, port authorities. Uh, these government agencies uh, have to also be involved in nurturing this kind of work. There's a lot we can do. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Muhammad. Thank you, Mr. Morial. I have Thank you. another question. After the death of George Floyd, a number of institutions, a number of financial institutions, uh, announced plans to do more and better. Uh, I noticed one earlier this year, Goldman Sachs uh, announced a One Million Black Women initiative to provide $10 billion in direct investment capital over the next few years. Uh, tell me how successful or how many of these institutions have been, what have you noticed, 
And is this what you're saying is needed in terms of providing grants rather than loans? So I think in the case of the Goldman Sachs program, one million uh, black women is the name of the initiative. They have generated some success. Uh, some black women owned businesses have gotten equity investments. Uh, some black women owned nonprofits have gotten philanthropic grants through the program. There's also another program at JP Morgan Chase called Advancing Black Pathways. I have some visibility on those programs. Uh, they have, I think, made a, a difference and they have begun. Here's the trick. These programs are not meaningful unless they're permanent. Mm -hmm. Sustainability is the key. Helicopter programs breed cynicism and distrust. Where a company comes in, makes a one or two year commitment and then rolls out or a three year commitment and rolls out. These commitments have to be long-term. Our systemic economic problems go back to 1690. Our systemic economic problems represent a myriad of, 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 of years of barriers by laws and practices that have gone on for hundreds of years. It cannot be undone. There is no nuclear equity bond that can be dropped and boom, it all goes away. So my thing is for some of these businesses, these commitments are real and they are beginning to yield benefits. However, I'm saying to everyone, gotta sustain them over a long period of years. You know, if structural racism tilted the boat this way and you began to level the playing field, you can't say you don't keep working on leveling, it's gonna go back. You gotta keep, 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 keep pushing to level the playing field. So I think that there have been a number of businesses that have made commitments. But if you look at the 2,200 publicly traded companies in the United States, maybe 10% of them make commitments, maybe uh, uh, a small number against the whole made the kind of commitments we need, but they have got to be sustainable to have impact. Uh, and I think uh, I would also encourage the Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan Chase's and the others to be transparent about who's benefited from these initiatives so the community can see. The community, if the community can't see, the community won't trust. If the community can see, they will trust. These initiatives are significant, but they could be larger. They could be more significant. Given the importance of our community as a voting base, a consumer base, and given the magnitude of the depth of the disparities, you know, our Economic gulf remains wide in this country from an income point of view and a wealth point of view. Uh, and, and that is a reality that uh, we have to continue to confront. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Wilson, you have your hand up. Uh, yes, I'll be very brief. Uh, thank you, uh, President Morial, for uh, just an incredible lecture. You know, as you were talking, I was reflecting back to uh, the um, founding of the Negro Business League, uh, Booker yep. T. Washington, um, if you will, about 120 years ago. Uh, and I, I guess my comment is, um, I, I, I'm sort of of the mindset that perhaps one of the greatest um, barriers to growing more Black entrepreneurs is access to capital. Yes. If, if indeed that is remotely accurate, uh, do you see a need to kind of do something similar to what Booker T. Washington did in 1900 uh, to establish perhaps something like a National Black Business Development Fund um, where um, uh, Black entrepreneurs uh, that are wanting to jumpstart their businesses could actually go to, much like the United Negro College Fund is for some HBCUs, uh, to get grants and seed money to I think, I think that's an excellent idea, uh, uh, Dr. Wilson. I think that there are a number of smaller funds that aim to do that that have popped up. 
uh, in, 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 in some of these Wall Street firms. I don't know if there's a, one single one or one single comprehensive one, but the answer is yes. But I also think that the center uh, that Omar runs and the work that you all are doing uh, you know, at the Earl Graves School of Business and Management can also help to teach our small entrepreneurs what I call the venture capital game. You know, the venture capital tap dance. Uh, I shouldn't call it a tap dance. There's a methodology and there are a few black women owned businesses that I'm familiar with that uh, have been successful in securing money through the private equity where you, you go after seed capital uh, and then you, then you go to round one, round two, or round three, you try to build your business through a successive series. We have to learn that game. You know, that's a game of understanding it. We also, I think, at the Earl Grave School could invite some of those who have funds to maybe come over to the school and, uh, and talk to the students, right? There are a few, Comcast has created a fund. Uh, I'm trying to think of who else. Uh, uh, there's several that have created funds that are focused and we are encouraging uh, them, but we, we also, just because the fund is there doesn't mean we have access to it. Uh, just because the fund is there doesn't mean it's positioned to do as you said. What you're talking about something that helps people in the startup phase, you know, in the early going, which is the hardest place sometimes to get funds. Uh, in the mainstream community, they, you know, there's friends and family. You know, there's friends, there's family, there's savings, there's, you know, equity in the family home, which typically in the mainstream community, because we're disadvantaged in many cases and don't have that depth of family wealth. Uh, we don't have that kind of ability to start up our businesses, but I think you could play a really important role. Uh, I, I think you're absolutely spot on uh, in, in, in that there should be funds specifically enumerated to help people get started. And let's be honest, a city could do that. A state could do that. A city and state with some foundations in the Baltimore region could do that. Uh, there are, you know, resources available to, in effect, help an entrepreneur perhaps get started. Uh, let's help them get on their feet. Sometimes the first 20 to 25,000, I give you, and who are, are in the personal care business, right? And I met a woman who was in the personal care business she, uh, she, uh, she, she did hair. She says, well, look, here's where I am. If I could afford six more stations, right? For people to work, I could create opportunity for six people who now work out of their homes to come here. And then I can also provide an opportunity for someone that's going to do nails and facials as well I said, well, what do you need? She said, well, I just need about $30,000 to buy the equipment that I need. And then I'm going to create a plus up value for not only myself, but for many, many other women entrepreneurs. So sometimes it is as simple as that, right? Uh, it is not complex. What do you need the money for? Well, I need the money for some equipment and for some supply. Right. I had an entrepreneur say, well, I just got a big contract from company A, but company A pays slow. They pay on a 120 day plan. I got to buy equipment. I got to buy supplies to serve them. I got to pay them half cash up front and then the rest. So I'm just caught in this vicious trap. People said, OK, you just need resources to tie you over. And I think that we have to, you know, think of new ways uh, to do that. So I think your thought is a good thought. And I think uh, you all could play a very important role at the Old Grave School to maybe pull some of this together. We have a, a question now from Mr. Hawkins.
Mr. Hawkins, can you unmute? Sorry about that. Mark? Hey, how are you? I'm well. Hey, Mark, um, really quick, uh, thanks again. Um, you spoke of mindset. You spent some time talking about capital, and I think that's important. And Dr. Wilson, I think your comment about capital is spot on. Um, I'd like to pick up on another of your comments about mindset. Um, is there a role for your organization or similar organizations to help change our mindset? You went back to the historical perspective. We, our history around entrepreneurship going back to post-slavery, reconstruction alike. But, and you, then you started to talk about 1971 and the list there, but something happened where we started to shift to more, uh, uh, I mean, you know, seeking employment. I'd love to hear your thoughts about yeah, you know, what your Kevin, organization we, 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 can do. You're so right. You know, you shift look, us. so I always say, you know, would, you, would your mama tell you? You know, and I think when, when the Civil Rights Act of 64 came, uh, and the beginning of opportunities for black people to work in governments, city governments, state governments, the federal governments, particularly in many of our cities. And also the doors to corporate America began to be open. It was seen as preferable to being self-employed. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, there was sometimes a mindset that we were self-employed because we had no other opportunity. And so it is though we had a little bit of a paradigm shift. Paradigm shift uh, in, uh, in our community away from building businesses, away from, and you know, your, your mother, your mother, I always say your mother, I'm using my mother's voice, which was sometimes, uh, look, you know, you, you, you know, you get a job, you're gonna have a regular paycheck to take care of your, your, your family take care of your children. And she'd say some of these entrepreneurs were living through feast and famine times because that was the necessity of the moment. So we did have a bit of a paradigm shift. I do think what I see, uh, and this is not scientific, it's not documented with a lot of the new generation millennials, and Gen Zs is a lot who say, I want to be self-employed. I want to do my own thing. I want to control my own talent, my own time, my own hours. So is there scientifically a shift? But that shift that you mentioned did occur, you know, to some great extent uh, in, in the 70s. And it was, it so was, my, it was there. yeah, so I, I, I think you're right. My, my follow up to that, though, is there a specific role, I guess, even that's on the, the entrepreneurial side, but also just in the way that black businesses are perceived. So you take what happened in Japan, oftentimes before then they, they, their products were perceived as being in, you know, of low quality. And then the perception in the community shifted where Japanese products then seemed like they were of such high quality. Now, is there not, you know, it's perceived that we provide low customer service. It's perceived that, you know, we can't respond well in business. We can't run business as well. I just wonder, is there a role, even for historically black colleges, perceived that it's a lower level of education, that our facilities are, are so bad that we can't manage well? Is there a role for an organization like yours or the NAACP to, to change just the way that our businesses and our and institutions are perceived. Uh, I, I know we can talk about capital, but things that we can actually do about changing the perception of our services. If you, if you know, Kevin, that, I, think, I, think, I think it's a very penetrating comment because implicit in it is implicit, with, it involves implicit and explicit bias. Sometimes perception is because of a narrative that's been created of inferiority. I think we have to defeat it by example. You know, I think when you have an opportunity, uh, you have to work to do your best to meet the best standards. Uh, I also think that we have to continuously encourage people and those of us to be conscious about working to spend money 
with people in our own community yeah. or spending money at black owned businesses. You know, I don't have an easy answer because some of this is baked in, but I think it starts with, it starts with also, uh, you know, leading by example. I mean, to an extent, for example, Morgan State does business with a lot of businesses. I mean, we, we do, we're doing a huge project in uh, Harlem. We have uh, uh, three developers. The lead developer is a black developer that was very important to us. Uh, we, we're using, we use black lawyers, uh, black architects and black engineering companies uh, on the project. It was very important to us. I think we have to lead by example too, uh, to say, look, we, uh, use these black businesses and they were second to none. But it is yeah. it is a mindset that we have to disavow. Look, in some cases, yeah, right? People may not have good customer service, but but it's not particular peculiar to black owned business, right? Yeah, I've had slow service in lots of restaurants, right? That's right. Sometimes some of the best restaurants That's right. have slow service. And yeah. and and but but I do think that awareness uh about about Beating the perception comes from trying when we have an opportunity. We have to set set examples, uh, and and we have to push back at uh, maybe sometimes the instincts. Look, I, I I think that for example, because of people ask me, because I see I get a chance to move in circles where I hire a lot of people. I see a lot of successful people say, "What I see, I see." Well, I see people from historically black colleges and universities. I see successful people from elite schools. I see uh, successful people from colleges that I've never even heard of, right? Um, I don't think uh, you know a particular type of college means that you are automatically successful or that you are automatically limited, uh, for example, right? And that's my unscientific analysis based on the many, many people I run into across the board who are doing significant work uh, in the private sector, the public sector, the governmental sector? It's a good question. It's a penetrating question, but and an important, you know, variable. We, I, I'll, I'll close with this on that. Perceptions have an element that is part of institutional and implicit bias, right? And we have to remember that. So it's one way to defeat it is we have to say that it is perception that is in many times inaccurate. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Morial, do you have time for one more question? Yes, I do, thank you. All right, this is from uh, Dean Bogosian. Thank you, President Morial. Thank you for being with us this afternoon and we're very excited to have you. We have close to 80 participants on this call. Thank you very much. I just want to share with you a couple of things that we're doing in the Earl G. Graves School of Business in line with uh, the issues that you have raised. Uh, number one, you talked about education. Uh, so our curriculum in the entrepreneurship uh, space is the most comprehensive that we've worked with uh, the Wharton School of Business. Uh, it's uh, really top rate. Uh, second to none. So we're educating uh, future entrepreneurs. The second one is for the practicing entrepreneur. We have been working with uh, the, Gold, uh, the Goldman Sachs, uh, 10,000 oh, yeah. small business program, uh, for which we have graduated over 400 practicing entrepreneurs to make sure that their businesses grow and remain sustainable and profitable. And the third one that we're working on is uh, in collaboration with uh, Howard University and uh, Clark Atlanta and Texas Southern uh, with a grant from uh, the PNC uh, Foundation. Uh, we are, we have divided the nation among uh, the four schools and we have become a hub for uh, sharing knowledge and practices, best practices for uh, entrepreneurship at HBCU, so between the four institutions, we have covered a large swath of the entrepreneurship uh, programs at, at HBCUs around the nation. Uh, so we are doing our part and we have had the support of uh, our administration and our corporate partners as well. And we've also been uh, uh, inviting uh, uh, executives in residence 
uh, this year we will be getting someone uh, who just retired from Goldman Sachs to be an executive in residence for us. This will be the third or fourth person we've had over the years. And uh, we would like to extend to you an invitation to, if time permits, to come and uh, give a lecture to our students in the entrepreneurship program. Thank you very much. Let me say this, Dean and uh, Mr. President, Dr. Wilson, this, what you're doing is impressive. Keep on doing it. All of these partnerships that you've developed, uh, I think is, is, is really where it is to bring those that are practically involved in this work into the academy, into the university setting to enhance the learning and the capabilities uh, and, 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 and the vision horizon uh, of our students. You know, some of it's vision horizon. I need to see myself. I need to understand where I can go. I need to understand that uh, what's behind that wall or behind that seat or behind that glass. So uh, let me just, just say, keep on keeping on. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm on the train between New York and, and, uh, and DC all the time. So quick stop in Baltimore is always, always good. And we have great crab cakes. <laughs> you got the best. Send me some. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure there's some black entrepreneurs who are selling those too. Hey, uh, hey, let's 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 have a call. I think right. that brings our Q and A to a close. Miss um, Benz, is it back to you? Uh, yeah, it's. Uh, we're just going to close out. Thank you so much, so much. Fantastic uh, lecture today. Uh, the, uh, your earlier remarks about uh, going back to the old days and how we were entrepreneurs out of necessity just reminded me of my own family. So I appreciate you. Yeah. Uh, you covered all the bases. Uh, just I'll turn it over to Dr. Wilson for a one, uh, a one minute quick uh, final closing uh, remarks and we'll let you go. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, actually, you have been so generous with your time. This has been, been just terrific. Uh, just once again, thank you to Kevin Hawkins for making this possible. Uh, and yeah, thank, thank you, Mark. Kevin. Yeah, and thank you, Mark, for uh, carving uh, all of this time out of your schedule uh, to put this very important issue before us uh, and along the way uh, to challenge us to even think more deeply and wider about some of the things that we are doing here, even though uh, that list is already impressive. Uh, and so we look forward to connecting back with you uh, and getting you here physically on campus again uh, very soon. Uh, and thank you once again uh, for um, uh, your uh, making these remarks to what we call our national treasure, Morgan State University.